Let's go ahead and pray and get into the study. Dear Lord, um, it's just amazing how every year as things change and seemingly things speed up on your prophetic calendar and your, your words come more alive every year. <laughs> and uh, Lord, he wrote in our ancient times from our perspective, but you were just as much God back then. And so, Lord, we are your children. You sustain us. You created us for your good pleasure. Our purpose is found in your person. And uh, therefore, Lord, we just know that even though we're looking 700 years before Christ, the principles that we're going to talk about today are applicable to us now because you're the ever-present one, Lord, and you know us better than we know ourselves. And so as we, as we pick out these principles and we discuss them and as we dive deeper into your truth, God, may you just minister to our hearts for such a time as this, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So we've been in a section of Isaiah known as Isaiah's Apocalypse. And Apocalypse actually means a, a revealing, but it's come to mean the last days because of the last book of the Bible, you know, is, is a book of revelation or the, the Apocalypse is, is also what it's called in the Greek. And, and it means the revealing of Christ. But when Christ is fully realized what, what he's doing, he's wrapping everything up. And so the fullness of his plan is realized in the book of Revelation. But Isaiah has a lot to say, and certainly we're in Daniel on Sundays, and Daniel has a lot to say about this apocalypse or this last day period of time. Now, prophetically, you need to understand that as we, as we dig through Isaiah, everything isn't absolutely completely obvious all the time when you read prophecies. There's hints here, there's hints there. And as we discovered as we went through um, Mark in the New Testament, as Jesus starts teaching in parables, what he's doing is he's allowing people to have a chance to dig in and to believe or not. He's actually giving them a choice. For unbelievers, they can walk away, or those that don't want to dig deeper, they can just walk away. And so a, par a parable is a come alongside truth, right? It comes alongside of the truth, and you're like, ah, why are you talking about wheat? <laughs> you know, we don't have anything to do with wheat. Why are you talking about sheep and goats? Why are you talking about this great pearl? You know, whatever, you know, and they walk away from it. And, and many times prophecy is like that. Some prophecy is very clear. Obviously, some of the chapters in Isaiah have been extremely clear, and they just pop out right in your face. Daniel is one where the, is, many of the prophecies are very clear. But again, we're looking back at hindsight. But understand, when, when the Lord spoke in the, uh, in the Sermon on the Mount, he said, those who seek will find. Those who knock the door is opened. Right, and, and so these things the Lord wants us to dig deeper into. I've been reading this, this book. Uh, it's just a novel, but it's, it's, it's pretty cool because it's set in the time when the Messiah, Messianic fervor was happening and Jesus is, is coming into Jerusalem. And you have Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea. And again, this is fiction, but it's, it's hypothetically how they could have gotten together to the point where they were willing to take this dead body off the cross and bury it in a tomb and identify with Jesus, even though the pressure was greatly against them. What was the evidence that brought them to that point? And these men were seekers of truth wherever it would take them. Because a lot of, a, a lot of others, their truth was, don't mess with my income. Don't mess with my popularity. Don't mess with my power. Don't mess with my position. That was their reality. But these men got to a point being members of the Sanhedrin, where they were saying, I'm going to follow truth wherever it takes me. And, and so as, as we've been going through Isaiah, and I've been reading this novel at the same time, I'm going, oh, they're actually going through Isaiah. And they actually had to pick out things, right? Because it was a little confusing. In hindsight, we have this great sight, right? We understand Jesus came the first time to save men from themselves, and eventually, he's going to redeem them physically from the earth, and he's going to redeem the earth from the fall as well. And then we'll enter into this thing called the millennial period, where the earth is, is redeemed. And, and so, as, as we look at Isaiah, some of these prophecies are, are kind of like, oh, as we look back, we go, that's significant, <laughs> right? But again, I think the Lord was really wanting to find the disciples that were willing to ask to seek and to knock. 
and they would find. And so it's, it's wonderful for us to be able to look back in the Old Testament and go, oh my gosh, the New Testament is defined in the Old Testament. The New Testament, or the Old Testament just gives so many pictures of the New Testament. And so as we look at this, this known as Isaiah's apocalypse, Peter tells us in the New Testament that, that these men that were writing these prophesy, prof, prophecies were so desirous to understand them like we get to understand them. And so we're going to look at some of these prophecies uh, tonight. Now, today, as we're in, in chapter 27, we, this, this section of Scripture, as it's been nicknamed, basically, started in uh, chapter 24, right? In 24, it dealt with the end times, a picture of the devastation on earth during what uh, we believe to be the upcoming tribulation period. In 25, we, we took a peek of what it would look like during the millennial period and then the eternal kingdom, the new Jerusalem. And then in 26, we saw the nation of Israel would get through this trial we know as a tribulation period. And today we're looking at more of the full restoration of the nation of Israel as it comes through the, tri uh, through the tribulation and the destruction of those that would oppose God's plan. And so let's go ahead and start reading at Isaiah chapter 27, verse 1. It says, In that day the Lord, with his uh, severe sword, great and strong, will punish Leviathan, the fleeting serpent, serpent, Leviathan, that twisted serpent, and he will slay the reptile that is in the sea. Now, literally, the Lord talks about the Leviathan and the behemoth when he's talking to Job at the end of Job, and he's talking about his creation. And personally, I believe these to be uh, dinosaur-like creatures that eventually died off as the atmosphere around the earth would have changed after the flood, Okay. But he talks about Leviathan, and the, the idea of a Leviathan, it's like a sea monster or like a dragon. But we also know that Satan is also called what? The dragon, the serpent as well. And we also know that very, uh, it, it, there's very clear pictures in the scriptures, and it's not much of a stretch to realize when the Lord talks about the seas, that seas touch many different countries. And so when you're specifically talking about the Mediterranean Sea, you're talking about the realm where the Bible story was carried out. And so you're talking about the nations. And so as we're going to see here in a minute, he's going to judge and slay that reptile that is in the sea or in the nations, and we will see that. And, and when this happens, though, Satan is going to lose. Now, this is good news. I'm going to look at this one because it's a complete screen. <laughs> So, um, in Revelation chapter 12, verse 7, it says, And war broke out in heaven. Michael, which is mentioned as an archangel, arch meaning pinnacle or top or most powerful, Michael and his angels fought the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought. But they did not prevail, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. Now, somewhere uh, in the middle of the tribulation period, Satan is cast down, which means he's locked out of heaven. He's locked out of access to God's throne, whether it's dimensional, whether it's a physical place, what, you know, whatever it is, uh, he is locked out of that place and he is condemned to earth and he knows his time is short. And, and when someone knows their time is short, they get angry, right? It's like, you're going you're gonna to take me out, but I'm going to hurt you as much as I possibly can. And so at that period of time, some people know that as the great tribulation or the more intense period of the tribulation as Satan is just going crazy on the earth. But he is thrown out of, out of heaven, out of having access to heaven. Now, he's also known as the accuser of the brethren, one of his names. It says in Revelation 12:9. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old, called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world, and he was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Verse 10, and then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren who accused them before God day and night has been cast down, and they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives to the death. 
And so even though it, it seems this voice down here in verse um, um, 10 seems you know, to be you know, pr pronouncing something, listen, people will prevail who belong to God, right? And so they're singing of the victory and they're not going to be lost. Why? Because God gives them incredible endurance through trial sometimes. And so even though he's known as the accuser of the brethren, we are able to overcome the wiles of Satan. Now, I'm not a guy that says, okay, you know, there's this old comedian, I don't know, early 70s probably, his name was Flip Wilson. And he'd always say, the devil, the devil made me do it, you know, and that was his big thing, right? And everything that happened, it was always the devil made me do it. Listen, Jesus came to save me from myself. I'm quite capable of sinning myself. And Satan can also trip me up and cause me to sin, right? But I've been saved from myself by the blood of Jesus Christ. And he is also able to protect me from the evil one. Remember, you're supposed to pray that in your prayers, right? Protect us from the evil one. And so Satan wants to mess with you. He hates you. Why? Because God loves you so much. He hates what God loves. And the only way, he knows he's condemned, the only way he can hurt God is by hurting those that God loves. And so he actually does hate you. So I'm not a guy that leans on all my problems are Satan's problems. But I'm also a guy that does believe that there is an invisible war going on. These angels that, w that were once serving God, it's believed a third of them for various reasons rebelled against God and have been fighting against God and the good angels or the angels that are still serving God for all these thousands of years. But we can overcome these pressures from the evil one. How? Well, it says in verse 11, they overcame him by the blood of the lamb, the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives to the death. So they held on to what? The gospel message. You know, Satan can trip me, but he can't steal me out of God's hands. Romans chapter 8. He doesn't own me. The blood of the lamb owns me. God created them, and, and they're even sustained by God. So he's way bigger than they are. They're not like this equal force, you know, the yin and the yang. They're not like the dark side and the light side battling together. <laughs> God is powerful. And so to remember that, that's putting on the helmet of what? Salvation. And that's understanding that. How do you keep that at the forefront of your mind? You just need to be reminded day in and day out that you're a child of God, right? So how do you overcome this spiritual battle in your life? You remind yourself of Jesus Christ and his love for you. So they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. Lord, you have done, and I have your testimony as well. You have done in me, you have done in those around me, and you have done throughout all of history incredible things this word of your testimony. And number three, not loving their lives to the death. Humility, Christian character, uh, a good perspective. Because ultimately, we're not supposed to fear man because what, man, what can man do to you? Well, they can take away your physical life. They can torture you temporarily. But who holds your eternal life in his hands? God. And, and he's the one that you're supposed to respect not man. So as bad as things are, as far as man doing things to you, they're all just temporary. Satan can only mess with you in a temporary way. And you hold on to the Lord. So when he's cast down out of heaven, as, as the Lord, you know, again, we're jumping from Isaiah chapter 27, and it talks about that certain serpent, that Leviathan being taken out. Again, Revelation 12, Therefore rejoice, O heavens, you who dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down to you having great wrath because he knows that he has a short time. So he's freaking out. Now when the dragon saw that he had been cast to the earth, he persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child. Again, out of the book of Revelation, but very clear symbolically, Israel was considered... 
God's wife. And the child that was born was the promised child. It was Jesus Christ. And so as Satan comes to the earth, he's going to be uh, railing against the Jews and those that are believers. But eventually he is destroyed. So one day Satan is going to lose for good. In Revelation 20, verse 10, it says, The devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. Revelation 20, 10. So eventually he does absolutely lose. The Lord takes care of him. And it is interesting because this idea of a lake of fire, uh, uh, this idea of a place that is separated from the goodness of God, where people are, are not, it doesn't say tortured, it says they're tormented. And understand, torment comes from within you. They're in a place of torment because that's what they've chosen. A lot of people say, well, how can God send people to hell? No, he's not sending people to hell. He's honoring their wishes because they don't want to be with him. Right? People want all the stuff of heaven without God. You, you can't have that that way. If you have God, he is the center attraction of heaven and everything else is just, even the streets of gold, eh, whatever. You're going to see God. Right? And, and when you love God and when you've chosen him. But people say, well, God sends people to hell. He doesn't send people to hell. He's honoring their wishes. And here's the problem. If people that, that hate God and don't want to be with God, if they go to heaven, heaven would be hell for them. Right? I hate those Christians. I hate going to church. I hate being in a church. And so would you force someone like that to church or would they even come with you if you invited them? No, because they just hate everything about it. If they get to heaven, what, they're going to hate everything about it <laughs> because everything is a reflection of the glory of God. And so our relationship with God is relational. It's not just goodies and goodie bags, <laughs> right? It is relational. But Satan is cast out. He's cast away. And, and what we find is that's, there's a thousand-year period between the false prophet and the Antichrist being thrown into the lake of fire. A thousand years later, who's still there? They are. And now who's added to that? And then books are open. And hell wasn't created for man to be there. Hell was created for the angels, Satan and his followers. The problem is man chooses to reject God like Satan and his followers. And so there is a place. And I don't get all goody-goody, fun-fun. It's a scary thing. And when I really think about it, I say people that, that I think are the worst of the worst, it's scary to think that they would even go there. I mean, it is a radical radical truth but the other side of that truth is god is absolutely just he is absolutely just so if he just let people off the hook or if he was unjust enough to force people into heaven that wouldn't be justice would it right people are like well why doesn't god just send everybody to heaven you ask him do you like you, you think free you, you think slavery is a good thing they go no slavery is the worst well, if God forced people into heaven, wouldn't that be spiritual slavery? So if you don't want to go, don't go. But I'm scared for you. I don't want you to miss out on heaven because the alternative isn't so good. <laughs> but anyways, one day Satan does lose for good. And what a glorious time that'll be. So verse one, he says... In that day, the Lord, with his severe sword, great and strong, will punish the Leviathan, the fleeing serpent, the Leviathan, that twisted serpent, and he will slay the reptile that is in the sea or amongst the nations. And verse 2 goes on, it says, And in that day I will sing to her a vineyard of red wine. I, the Lord, keep it. I water it every moment, least I hurt it. I keep it night and day. Who's the vineyard? 
We've run into this theme of the vineyard multiple times already in Isaiah, but one of the most clear examples that shows us what the vineyard represents here is Isaiah chapter 5, the parable of the vineyard. And he's talking about his people and his love for his people. So he says here, a vineyard of red wine, a fruitful people, I, the Lord, keep it. I guard it. I treasure it. I water it. I provide for it. At least any hurt it, hurt it, I keep it night and day. And so he waters his vineyard. You know, sometimes we think, oh, God is just so against me all the time. Or you'll come up to me and you'll, you'll describe a situation you're in. And very often it's because other people are doing stuff that's hurtful towards you. And I always like to remind you, this isn't just their trial. This is for you as well. And so as hard as it is, the Lord always has some lesson of growth for you. He's always watering us. You know, I, I, I have things and I have hurts in my life. And, and if, 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 if you're like me, you know, you, you think you've overcome this hurt. And then all of a sudden, what does it do? Brings itself right back into the front of your memory. You're like, darn it. <laughs> you know, <laughs> why can't it just go away? But what I've learned to do is back up and say, thank you, Lord, that you've gotten me through the toughest times of that. And, and thank you that I've grown in lessons through the history of this hurt that has just been brought up to mind. And then I'm like, is there anything else I need to learn? Because when I say never waste a good trial, guys, I really mean it because I practice it. It isn't just a cute thing that pastor says. He says it because he understands it, right? Consider it pure joy, my brethren, when you face trials of various kinds, knowing that your, the testing of your faith produces patience and let patience have its good work, that you may be good, complete, finished, not lacking in any good, th any good thing, right? <laughs> And so, man, I tell you, some of the biggest hurts I can look back, as, as long as they're distant enough, <laughs> I can actually look back and go, oh my gosh, I'm a different person because of it. I'm a better person because of it. And how long does my character get to change? For eternity. You know that car accident that destroyed that car that you thought was, you know, it became an idol? You know what? That car was eventually going to be left behind. But what do you take with you? The character from all those lessons you learned by wrecking your car, or whatever it might have been. You know, you go, you went through a divorce. Oh, failure. But if you're willing, God's going to teach you all kinds of things through that trial. And that trial fades. And you know what? Eventually, all those hurts fade. Former things pass away. But all the character that was developed from those hurts move into where? Eternity. And God is creating things in you that bring him glory for all of eternity, even now. And we all suffer hurts. And I'm not going to like play the game of whose hurts are worse hurts or who has more hurts or whatever. But we have them. How are you going to deal with them? God says you have a place to go, Right? But in the middle of it, the God's favorite thing is in the middle of it, he loves to surprise you with a little joy. He loves to surprise you with a little comfort. He loves to uh, surprise you with a little wisdom, right? Smack dab in the middle of a trial, he will just drop this little bloop of wisdom on you or peace out of nowhere that surpasses all understanding. How in the world did that happen? And he does it again and again and again. And what he's doing is he's watering you. He's breaking up the ground. He's, he's fertilizing it. And, and, and he's watering you. He's, he's bringing you a little bit further. And he says, I water it every moment. And if you look at the history of Israel, and if you saw Israel itself, the nation as a person, they went through some radical times, right? And the Lord kept on bringing them back. Kept on bringing them back kept on bringing them back. And they felt like, God, you've taken your hand off of me. He never did, did he? He put them through, he, he uh, carried them through every trial. And so we are watered. We are watered by the Lord. How are we watered? 
Well, in Psalm 1, verse 3, and he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does, he shall prosper. Where does it start off? Well, it starts off that Psalm, Psalm 1. Do not walk in the council and sit and stand in the seat and, and the path of scorners, scoffers, and doubters. But the righteous is not like that. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. What is the difference between a scoffer and a mocker and, and, and a man of God? A man of God is going to be pulling wisdom from those that are wise and from the word of God that is wise, right? He should be like a tree planted by the water whose bears its fruits in its season, whose leaf does not wither. And so as you're going through a trial, just remember the word of God is always there and, and you can allow it to minister to you. He will send people to you to give you wisdom and he loves to do so. And this is how he waters us even through the hard times. John 7, 38 says, he who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke concerning the spirit whom those believing in him would receive. For the Holy Spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. But eventually the Holy Spirit was given, right? And so we're not like the Old Testament saints where if God needed to use them in a supernatural fashion, he would come upon them and then leave. Why? Because they only had the blood of bulls and goats making them pure. But in the New Testament, we have the precious blood of Jesus Christ that always makes us pure. And so in the New Testament, Paul told the Corinthians, you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And so now the Holy Spirit is able to dwell within us. And he's a Holy Spirit of knowledge and comfort and, and, and encouragement, wisdom. All, I mean, the Holy Spirit does so much in our lives. He is the one that is present with us. Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, called him the paraclete or the come alongside helper. So we are watered by the presence of the Holy Spirit. We're gonna see in the book of Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And as, as they were thrown into the fiery furnace, Nebuchadnezzar saw four people in the fire. Now, that was a physical picture. And many times, Old Testament physical truth translates into a New Testament spiritual truth. And Jesus said, I will never leave you, nor will I forsake you. And then he goes up in the clouds. Well, what happened? He sent the, the Holy Spirit to be with us. And he never leaves us, nor does he forsake us. How does God water us? Through the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives. One of the ways to feel watered by the presence of the Holy Spirit is to put the word of God in you and to allow God as a master builder to apply it to your lives on a regular basis. And also just to understand and know the presence of the Holy Spirit in your life and be reminded and, and be aware of it. Because sometimes we just get so busy and we distract our brains in so many different ways that we don't even recognize the power that God has right here living in us. Then how are we also watered? 1 Corinthians 3, 6, I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. People speak into our lives, don't they? And other people that are also filled with the Holy Spirit and moved by God to speak into our lives. You guys, if you have Christian friends, which you should because we, we sharpen one another, we, we spur one another on towards love and good deeds. How many times are you having a casual conversation with a Christian, a mature Christian brother or sister, and they say something and you're like, bing, just nails you right between the eyes. They have no idea that they said it, but the Holy Spirit said it right through them, right? And it's like, I just had this conversation. And man, it happens to me all the time. Hopefully it happens through me all the time. But it does happen to me all the time for sure. And people are just dropping wisdom. And so those that are around you also minister and water you. In fact, I'm very fond of saying, you know, as far as the movement of the spirit in my life, as far as spiritual gifts, People always, you know, create this big mystery around them and everything. And it's like, you know what? I'm a conduit of God's life-giving words. I'm a conduit of God's life-giving spirit or the water of the Lord, right? And, and if I see the world as a desert, 
You know, the Lord can rain down or he can send his message specifically to a person that needs it. And all a hose is, is a delivery system, a very specific delivery system. You know, my prayer is with the Holy Spirit, Lord, make me a good hose. I just want to be a good hose. And a good hose delivers what God wants him to deliver, to deliver in a very specific, in a very uh, uh, personable, uh, identified, targeted way. And, and that's what the Lord does through me with the gifts of his spirit. And so I'm like, God, whatever you want to do through me, here I am, use me. Oh, I just want to be a good hose. <laughs> you know, I want your living water to spring out of me through, uh, and, and through me and minister to other people. But again, you know, one, one of the points is as you go through trials, recognize Satan does want to destroy you. John 10.10, 10, the thief does not come except to steal and kill and destroy. And I have come that they may have life and they may have it more abundantly. Very practical way this is, that this works in our life. Few places as I get older and my, my bones start to creak and all my old injuries start to creep up on me. Few places are more miserable than a long plane ride and you're stuck in the middle. And for whatever reason, they don't have the heat or the, the air conditioning up high enough and you're just miserable. You gotta go to the bathroom. Even if you don't have to go to the bathroom, if you're in the middle, you feel like you have to go to the bathroom, <laughs> right? It just all works against you. And then this person is big or this person is big or this person's decided I'm staking out my ground on the, you know, on the elbow pads and I have my foot where your feet are supposed to go or whatever, you know, and it just things like that happen. And Satan wants you to not be a witness. What do you do? Well, you resist the devil. You were planning on reading, you know, this Christian book, or you're planning on memorizing some scripture. Pull out your Bible. But be on your best behavior, too, because Satan wants you to fail, doesn't he? Are we capable of losing it? So who wins when we lose it? Satan. Satan just wants me to be so irritated at people. He wants me to hate people. Think about that. Who hates people? Satan, who loves people? God, right? And so, you know, just as simple as being on an airplane, driving down the freeway, I gotta put myself in check all the time, you know? I was driving down Ocean Drive, I can't remember where I was coming from today. Yeah, it was today. I was driving down Ocean Drive and uh, some cars were getting aggressive, you know, and this car in front of me is going super slow. So I got all these aggressive and then super slow. It's like the worst of both worlds, right? <laughs> you know? <laughs> and this person's trying, you know, I got my blinker on and he speeds up to make sure I can't get over, you know? And it's like, these are the times when, I, these are the simple times where you practice, you know, Jesus, take the wheel, <laughs> you know? <laughs> I think the B-52s had a, had a song about Satan taking the wheel, but, you know, we, we want Jesus to take the wheel, right? We want to go, okay, it doesn't really matter, you know, and then I look over and whenever, you know, almost every time I get frustrated with somebody, you know, I look over and I go, oh, man, it's somebody's grandma or something, you know, it's like, oh, you just feel so horrible, you call yourself a pastor, you know, whatever, but, but the thing is, what, what I'm trying to say is we have the opportunity to practice resisting the devil constantly. If you're married, right, and, you're, and your honeymoon, that three, first three years is over, <laughs> and it's like irritation takes over, uh-uh. Now I promise God to love this person. Uh, not, not today, Satan. You know, uh, Man, do we have a lot of time to practice resisting the devil? So then when bigger opportunities come to fail, we're actually pretty good at it. I knew I was, I, I actually went swimming today. I took, a, took an hour and went, jumped in the pool. 
you know, and even there, like I haven't swum for months and I got back in the pool and I did way fewer yards than I normally do. And uh, my feet started to cramp up and everything else. I'm like, it's okay, day one. Day one of being back in the pool, right? And I know in three months or so, I'll, I'll be ready to, to swim in the Senior Olympics. <laughs> I have. I probably will again. But day one, right? So we, uh, who's to think you're going you're gonna to be able to withstand the attack of Satan when he's just full bore, wants to destroy your witness, wants to mess up your family? wants to ruin your relationships and your witness at work. When Satan wants to do that, you know, day one, just start practicing tomorrow. Pull yourself back into check. You know, um, the saying is check yourself before you wreck yourself, right? Well, check yourself before you wreck your witness. Check yourself before you wreck your soul. It's really not worth it, but Satan... You know, that's where I think Satan just really, mm, he knows he can't have you, but if he can have your witness, that's a, that's a good thing. You know, and, and so just be aware of that. Be careful. Watch for the attacks from the devil, your great enemy. He prowls around like a roaring lion for some victim to devour. Take a firm stand against him and be strong in your faith. Remember that Christians all over the world are going through the same kind of suffering you are the New Living Translation, but it says what it says. So resist the enemy, you can. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. And so there's this enemy that's trying to take him out, but the Lord, or take you out, and the Lord just says, but I want to water you. I'm there present with you. I'm not going to leave you. I'm not going to forsake you. You can't have victory. But again, if you've never shot a BB gun, you want to go out and shoot a 50 cal first? Probably not. I want to start off with a pellet gun or something, right? And so this is where we need to practice on a day-to-day -day basis. Again, in verse 3, I, the Lord, keep it. I water it every moment, lest any hurt it. I keep it night and day. He's always there for you. He's always there for you. Psalm 121 is a song of ascents. It means this is one of the songs that is, as they were going up to Jerusalem to worship, most, most of the time during a festival, they travel from all over the, the country. And three times a year, the male heads of the families were supposed to go up to Jerusalem. But many times, the whole family would. You know, they didn't have the internet. They didn't have TV. They didn't have water parks. They didn't have these things to entertain. They didn't have staycation type of things. <laughs> And so they would plan, and they would head up. And as they would go, it would be a joyous time because they're going up to the center of their faith, their religion. And as they go up, they, they would sing these songs. It's a song of ascent. And he says, I will lift up my eyes to the hill from whence comes my help. My help comes from the Lord who made the heaven and the earth. I will not allow your foot to be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord shall preserve you from all evil, and he pres shall preserve your soul. The Lord shall preserve your going out and your coming in from this time forth and even forevermore. That is our Lord. Now, he is speaking specifically to the Jews, but this is his character towards who? His children and those he loves which also relates to us. Verse 4 back in Isaiah 27 says, Fury, fury is not me in me who would set briars and thorns against me in battle. I would go through them. I would burn them to, together. And so the idea is if someone tries to keep me from my people, they're not going to stop me. I will bust through anything. And so he cares about his people. He's not angry with us. Now, in the Old Testament, it seems like, okay, so he's angry like a parent who loves his children is disappointed in his children, and he needs to correct them, right? It's like, oh, there's a, there's a frustration that's born out of love. And it's very different than hatred. 
isn't it? Because the more you love, the greater expectation you have on the object of your love. That's why you get madder at your own children than you do other people's children. Because you, you, you love them so much, you want great things for them. And this is the type of love that God has towards us. He wants the best for us. He doesn't want, oh, don't make them choices, <laughs> right? But when he corrects, he corrects in such a way to bring about proper correction. And uh, I don't think you can uh, uh, accuse God of, of being your codependent because <laughs> he loves you enough not to help you down the road of sin. He's going to stand in the way of that sin because he loves you. And so he says, you, you, you can't set briars and thorns against me in battle. I would go through them. I would burn them together. I would just go right through them to get to my people. Or let me take hold of my strength, verse 5. That he, may, that he may make peace with me, and he shall make peace with me. Those who come, he shall cause to take root in Jacob. Israel shall blossom and bud, and I will fill the face of the world with fruit. And so he says, make peace with me. Make peace with the Lord. In Psalm 2, it says, kiss the face of the son, lest he be angry. And, and the fact of the matter is, you were created for God's good pleasure. And because of our inheritance and our own choices, we end up in rebellion against God and everything that is good. And he invites us back in to our absolute purpose. You know, people on earth are looking for purpose. And the Lord says, here's your greatest purpose. Your greatest purpose is to enjoy me and to allow me to enjoy you, right? It's that fellowship with God. That's what he created man for. That's why he gave man the ability to choose and have reason, right? And so he says, make peace with me. He says, this is my command. He says, believe in me. Believe in the one that the Father sent. And so make peace with God. Get right with him. And then he says, those who come, verse 6, he shall cause to take root in Jacob. Israel shall blossom and bud and fill the face of the world with fruit. Israel shall blossom and bud and fill the face of the world with fruit. So instead of being just dried up and just plucked out and eventually burned or thrown away, the Lord is going to establish the nation of Israel and it's going to be fruitful. And this is a prophecy. It's interesting because this is the time of the year where my wife loves to go to... Um, Home Depot or, or Lowe's or Walmart Garden Center and buy just stacks of little flowers. But by the middle of the summer, if you're like us, what happened to those little flowers? They're dried up and dead and ready to be thrown away or I like to burn things. So many times I just pick them up and burn them, <laughs> you know? But this isn't the promise for the Lord. And even though it may look like they wither for a time, he never lets them die. There's still a remnant of Israel today. And eventually they will flourish. But it is interesting that it talks about their fruit filling the earth. So in 1948, they were established again as a country. They started to reforce the country. Um, we, are, we are actually, we have a, a, an Israel uh, trip interest meeting coming up on Sunday. Is it this Sunday? Yeah, so it is this Sunday. And we've been to Israel many times. I think I've been six or seven times myself and just absolutely love it. But you would not think of Israel as a barren place. But Mark Twain had visited Israel way back in the last century, and he called it a pile of rocks, a barren place, gross and ugly. But they have planted millions of trees all over Israel. They're very industrious. And when they came back in their nation in 1948, they drained some swamps. They threw in some fruit trees. And you know what they do? 
they sell the abundance of their fruit to neighboring Muslim countries who turn around a profit and sell it to all the other Muslim countries. So all the people that hate them are actually giving the Jews money for their fruit because they are producing so much fruit. They produce so much fruit in order to keep the price at a profitable level, they leave more than half of their fruit on their trees. If you ever go there in the fall, you drive through the north where they drained out this swamp above the Sea of Galilee, and you're gonna be looking at these trees like, why don't they pick that fruit? And it's like there are more, there are more citrus or there's more fruit on the trees than there are leaves. And the, and the trees are heavy. And, and they just, you know, they, they, you know uh, ladies will put beads in their hair. They, they just look like, like thousands of beads, right? Because they produce so much fruit, and here it is. And it's several times in the scriptures. But it says here, and they will fill the face of the world with fruit. Isn't that interesting? Hmm. But the Lord desires for us to have deep roots. And the problems with the little flowers that we plant one, we don't water them enough, but two, <laughs> you can pull them up and they don't have deep roots. But I've discovered something. Every year, I, I, I try to pull up some of my weeds. And I have pulled up some weeds that have roots that are so deep. And they are going to survive the apocalypse, I tell you what. Because their roots are so deep. And you go down so deep and you're always going to find moisture. But what the Lord is saying is, I'm going to dig your roots deep. But this is what we need to do in our Christian walk as well. Because in the springtime, when there's plenty of water, dig your roots deep. Allow them to go deep. Get into the word of God. Don't just grab onto the Lord when it's hard, but when it's easy, create spiritual discipline and get those roots, roots deep in the Lord. So when you hit a dry time, or you hit a dust storm or whatever it is that you don't dry up, that you don't wither, that you don't just blow away to be tossed into the fire. And so we're supposed to develop deep roots through good spiritual discipline. And the Lord desires to de develop deep roots in you. Verse seven, it goes on, it says, he has struck Israel as he struck those, has he struck Israel as he struck those who struck him? Or has he been slain according to the slaughter of those who were slain by him? In measure, by sending it away, you contended with it. He removes it by his rough wind in the day of the east wind. Now, verse 7, in a different translation, it says, Has the Lord punished Israel in the same way he has punished her enemies? Basically, that's what he's asking. Has he struck Israel the way he struck those who were against him? No, because the enemies were punished for judgment. Israel is punished for correction, not for destruction, okay? And so again, there very much is a difference. As a good father, he knows how and when to discipline his children. It says in Hebrews 12, if you endure chastening, God deals with you as sons. For what son is there whom a father does not chasten? But if you are without chastening, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate, not sons. Furthermore, we have had human fathers who corrected us, and we paid them respect. I tell you what, my parents were kind of on me in junior high because I was number five out of six. So they kind of knew the story. And I get so mad at them. And now I look back and I go, oh, man, I wish they would have protected me more. <laughs> you know, looking back, because I have scars from those times when I rebelled against them. I respected them in, in hindsight. Um, furthermore, we've had human fathers who correct us, corrected us, and we paid them respect. Shall we not much more readily be in subjection to the Father of spirits and live? For they indeed for a few days chastened us, and it seemed best to him, but he for our profit, that we may be partakers of his holiness. Now, no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. Nevertheless, afterward, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Oh. Never waste a good trial. Verse 9, therefore, by this, the iniquity of Jacob will be covered. This is all the fruit of taking away, and this is all the fruit of taking away his sin. When he makes all the stones of the altar 
like chalk stones, which are beaten to dust, wooden images and incense and altars shall not stand. The iniquity, the sin of Jacob will be covered. And this is a prophecy of the ultimate sacrifice of Jesus. And this is the fruit. This is the result of taking away the nation's sin. What's he going to do? He's going to take the stones of the altar and he's going to destroy them. He's going to pulverize these altars. What altars is he talking about? He's certainly not talking about God's altars. He's talking about the altars to false gods. And so what he's saying is, once they realize that their sin is forgiven, there's going to be a radical repentance in their life. And this is what happens in our lives, right? We don't be good to be saved. We're saved, and therefore we change or we transform. And a lot of people like to argue, oh, repentance has to be a part of salvation. You have to repent and be saved in order for you to truly be saved. And I'm like, well, if you're saved, you're going to repent. Well, that's not always the case. I think it is. Because you can say you're saved, but if you don't change, are you really? <laughs> right? And so repentance is a result of salvation. And it's what happens. And so you can see true repentance. Repentance means to turn around or to turn away from. In 2 Corinthians 7, 9, it says, Now I rejoice not that you were made sorrow, sorry, but your sorrow led to repentance. So you can be remorseful and sorry without really changing your ways, right? But your sorrow led to repentance, he tells the Corinthians. For you were made sorry in a godly way. So you can have remorse or sorrow in a fleshly way. Bummer, I got caught. Or in a godly way, it's not who I want to be. I want to honor you, God. Right? That you might suffer loss from us in nothing. Verse 10, for godly sorrow produces repentance leading to salvation. Not to be regretted, but the sorrow of the world produces death. For observe this very thing, that you sorrowed in a godly manner. And the result of this sorrow, what diligence it produced in you, what clearing of yourselves, what indignation, what fear, what vehement desire, what zeal, what vindication in all things, you proved yourself to be clear in this matter. So what happens? Man, repentance is so powerful. A lot of times when we pray on Tuesday morning and Tuesday evening, we'll read scripture and we'll kind of Personally, if we feel like we have a need to, we'll say, Lord, I'm sorry that I do this. Lord, forgive us as a church for doing this. And Lord, we pray for other churches that may be doing this also, that you may bring revival. And it is so refreshing. And you might think admitting your sins and repenting is a heavy thing, but think about all the things that true repentance produces. Not only a desire to destroy those idols in our lives, which is sometimes we really need to do, right? Like you repent. Why would you go back to things that were your idols, that you worship, that you spent all your money and time on, right? So once you repent, the Lord wants you to pulverize those things that are in the past. And so it produces godly sorrow. So you actually have a distress. You have this emotional desire to turn. I don't like this anymore. You have earnestness, a careful diligence. You... You so desire to truly change, not just on the surface. I talk to a lot of pastors. And this idea of earnestness can go by the wayside because we get so practiced of doing the same thing week in and week out. And we can put up a facade without really having this earnestness in our heart. And that is one of the biggest problems pastors have because we can have a cold heart towards the things of God. And it's, it's inconceivable, isn't it? Like, oh man, you get to dig into God's word every day, but you know what? We allow it to become normal and we don't personally apply it to our lives. This earnestness in repentance is so important. It is so important. And I tell a lot of pastors, because I apply it to myself, again, don't check yourself, or you got to check yourself before you wreck yourself. Make sure that what you're reading is personally applied before you try to apply it to someone else. We can be so good at telling other people how to do it that we're not doing it ourselves. 
there's a clearing of yourselves, a vindication. You, you, you actually change. And people can accuse you, and you're like, yeah, maybe, but I'm not that same person. Right? Another indignation, literally much grief to the point of becoming ignorant or indignant. You, 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 you hate your sin so much. There comes a point when people hate their sin so much they're finally willing to do something about it. Deep repentance. You have a fear or a phobos. You just don't want to let God down. A healthy respect. A vehement desire or a longing for what is right. A zeal, a boil to be hot. Remember Jesus when he, when he threw the people out of the Temple Mount. Zeal for your house will consume me. The disciples remembered that verse in the Old Testament. A vindication, a, an avenging of wrong. You want to make things right. In all things, you have proved yourselves to be clear and everything demonstrated to be innocent. And it says, in all things. So a repentant person changes, right? So very often I make the statement, like, you know, if you're saved, is there a difference in your life? Is repentance actually a very good thing for our soul? It isn't just like a Debbie Downer, oh, I'm so bad. You know, that's, that's fake humility. But true repentance is actually a passion for God. And you want to be everything that he wants you to be. And, and, and all these things start to happen. And that's what Paul said to the Corinthians. All these things are true of repentance. Isaiah 27, verse 10, it goes on to say, Let the fortified city, or the fort, yet the fortified city will be desolate. So you're going to be watered. You're going to be taken care of. I'm going to walk with you through these things. I'm going to get your roots deep. You, you might go through some trials, but I'm there. You repent, and you're, you're going to be fruitful. Yet, verse 10, the fortified city will be desolate. The habitation forsaken and left like a wilderness. There the calf will feed, and there it will lie down and consume its branches. When its boughs are withered, they will be broken off. The woman come and set them on fire. For it is a people of no understanding. Therefore, he who made them will have no mercy on them, and he who formed them will show them no favor. There comes a point when that grace that God is allowing people to experience, when, when the mercy that he has on people, and he's given them every opportunity to repent and to turn, his desire is that none should perish and all should come to repentance. But there comes that point when it runs out. It is appointed to man to die once and then face a judgment. So eventually judgment comes. God is a perfect judge. He will, not, he will not judge anybody too harshly. But being the perfect judge also means he's not going to be too lenient on anybody else either. And so the enemies of God will be punished. Those that are his children are going to be refined. Verse 12, and it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord will thresh. That means separating the wheat from the chaff. From the channel of the river to the brook of Egypt, and you will be gathered one by one. O oh, you children of Israel. I love it that it says you will be gathered one by one. In the last days, and I believe this gathering is after the tribulation period, the Jews have been scattered because of persecution away from Israel all over the earth. And he knows every single one of their names who have put their trust in God. Isn't that cool? Because he knows our name. He has a nickname for us waiting for us in heaven that no one knows except us. You and God will know your nickname. He cares about us. And in that day, every single one by one, he's going to be able to pull them out. So it will be, verse 13, in that day, the, the great trumpet will be blown and they will come who are about to perish in the land of Assyria. And they who are outcasts in the land of Egypt then shall worship the Lord in the holy mountain at Jerusalem. Listen, the Lord knows who are his. You know who's going to be there as well at this day? In, in my belief, in the, my end time scenario belief as I study the scripture, you know, I, I believe we, we as the church 
are going to be taken away. God is going to again deal with Israel. And I believe Israel from Daniel chapter 9 is his timepiece, his time clock. And when he's done dealing with Israel, he's going to move into this period called the millennial period. But I believe the church at that point in time are actually in our eternal bodies. We have these new bodies that have been given us that are like Jesus' resurrected body, right? And so we'll be there as well. We're going to be in new bodies by that time. But many of those that made it through the tribulation are going to repopulate the earth. But we are going to be there at this celebration when this trumpet is blown. Now, understand a lot of people get confused because there's a lot of different trumpets that are blown in the scriptures. And trumpets are a gathering. Uh, they're, they're warning for war, but most of the time they're calling people for gathering. So there's a trumpet at the rapture, I believe, when God takes his church out. And I believe in John chapter 4, verse 1, a voice like a trumpet calls John up into heaven. And John is a Christian. A, a, beyond being Jewish, he is a Christian, right? And this voice says, come up here. And then he has a throne room of God and everything starts happening on earth. But where is John? John is up in heaven. Chapter 2 and 3 are all these letters to the church. Chapter 4 starts off with the Lord calling John. Where? Come up here into heaven. And that's a trumpet. I think those are the, the same trumpet sounds. There are seven more trumpets, though, in the book of Revelation, right? The trumpet judgments we know them as. And then there's a trumpet that blows when Jesus returns and the nation of Israel is gathered together at the end of the tribulation. And that is this trumpet that is referred to here. And it says in Matthew 4, or 24, uh, verse 30, it says, The sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send his angels with the great sound of a trumpet, and they will gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. So many people are moaning, and others are going, yeah. This is awesome. So those of the church, those that have been resurrected, those Old Testament saints will be there at this radical gathering at this period of time. And what a glorious day that'll be. But if you get anything out of today's message, let it, let it be that you just understand two things. God is with you in every trial. And he wants you to learn in every trial. Think of that trial as a watering. And when you doubt he's there, your doubts don't make him leave. Right? My daughters used to always go, but I don't feel like I believe in Jesus. But I believe in Jesus. But I don't feel like it. And I'd always look at him and go, you're a little person. And I know your feelings are big, but your feelings don't stop God from loving you. Do you think if you felt like I didn't love you that I'd stop loving you? No way. I'm going to love you no matter what. And I'm just your daddy. He's God. And, and, and just understand that, guys. In this times, it, it just seems backwards. Keep your nose in the scriptures. It's backwards, but God predicted all this backwardness. He predicted that man would get this bad. He told read Romans chapter 1. We're there. We are there, right? And Paul tells Timothy, man, there's going to be a day when people just want to hear what they want to hear. Stations call themselves news, and they're reporting no news. What are they reporting? Just what people want to hear on their side, right? We have no idea what the facts are out there, but I don't think they do either. It's their job just to give people what they want. We, we are living in those times, and God predicted it, and he loves you. So I would say every day get rooted deeper and deeper. And if things are going okay right now, don't back off. Make sure those roots are deep. If, if, you're, if you're in the middle of a dry time, realize the Lord's never going to let you completely dry out. Just, just keep on hanging on, and you will produce fruit. And learn, learn from everything. And finally, if you blow it, just repent. 
You know why David was a man after God's own heart? He repented really good. He, he needed to repent good because he did a lot of dumb things. What about Peter? He did a lot of dumb things. But what did Peter do different than Judas? He repented well. I've discovered that repentance is so refreshing for me because it just puts me in a good spot to learn of the Lord. Learn more and more and more. Let's go ahead and pray. Dear God, we thank you for your word once again. And just may it, may it be, Lord, that we are, are those that uh, show the true fruit of repentance in our lives, Lord. And just teach us more and more the healthiness of that repentance, God. Lord, we all love humble people. They're a blessing. Lord, may we be a blessing to others. May we add to the pool of that humility, God. May we, may we practice repelling Satan. Lord, because our, our flesh gets riled up. Satan starts tossing ideas in there, Lord. May we resist our flesh. May we resist the devil in the small things. So when a big thing comes along, Lord, you can just work through us and that we're ready, God. Lord, help us just to not let our guard down right now because this world needs your light to shine through us, Lord. So shine brightly, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's close with a song.